This week has seen DRC President Felix Chisekedi get support for his change agenda from U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. The change agenda aims to tackle corruption, improve human rights and strengthen national security. Plus, Nigeria's largest airline orders 10 jets from Brazilian manufacturer Embraer. This is Africa Focus. Here's a peek of the stories set in store today. Amid ruins lives, Mozambique cyclone survivors deliver babies. In Rwanda, a spring turns into a source of reconciliation 25 years on. Kenyan snake farm owner battles to secure more anti-venom as the country grapples with a shortage. I'm Lenny Rashid, and our sign language interpreter is Monica Mwangi. Before we get into the main stories, let's take a look at the news that made the headlines around the continent. Angry residents in Johannesburg's Alexandra Township staged a shutdown protest on Wednesday over the mushrooming of illegal structures and service delivery in the area. Various streets were barricaded with burning tires and rocks as hundreds of protesters marched on the streets demanding government for better services and living conditions ahead of the country's national election next month. One resident said he was tired of voting because it yielded no results, while another protester called on President Cyril Ramaphosa to directly address the problems the community was facing. The housing deficit is an emotive issue in Africa's most industrialized country, where 19% of families live in informal dwellings more than two decades after the end of apartheid rule. Despite promises by the ruling African National Congress Party to fast-track new homes for the poor, Alexandra Township lies next to the mansions and skyscrapers in Africa's richest suburb, Sandton. Algeria's president, Abdelaziz Boutelfika, has submitted his resignation. State news agency APS said on Tuesday following weeks of mass protests against his rule. The ailing 82-year-old leader stood down shortly after the army chief of staff demanded immediate action to remove him from office. On Monday, Boutelfika, who was in power for 20 years, has said he would quit before the end of his term on April 28th. But a protest leader and opposition parties rejected this as insufficient, while hundreds of students marched through the capital Algiers to demand the replacement of a political system wildly seen as incapable of significant reform. Boutelfika has rarely seen in public since he suffered a stroke in 2013. Senegalese President Macky Sall said on Tuesday that he would prioritize the environment, youth employment and women's rights during his second term in office. In an inauguration speech that followed an emphatic election victory in February, he promised vigorous environmental action. During Sall's first term, Senegal's economy grew more than 6% per year as a modernization program produced a new airport, sleek highways and a city built from scratch in scrubland outside the coastal capital, Dakar. Oil and gas production from new offshore fields is expected to keep the economy buoyant in the coming decade. But high pollution and rising sea levels have raised concerns about climate change and the price of rapid development. More than a dozen African heads of state attended his inauguration. The Democratic Republic of Congo's Ebola outbreak is spreading at its fastest yet, eight months after it was first detected, the World Health Organization said on Tuesday. Each of the past two weeks has registered a record number of new cases, marking a sharp setback for efforts to respond to the second biggest outbreak ever, as militia violence and community resistance have impeded access to affected areas. Less than three weeks ago, the World Health Organization said the outbreak of the hemorrhagic fever was largely contained and could be stopped by September, noting that weekly case numbers had halved from earlier in this year to about 26. But the number of cases hit a record 57 the following week and then jumped to 73 last week. Who spokesman Christian Lindmeyer said previous spikes of around 50 cases per week were documented in late January and mid-November. Lindmeyer said lack of access due to ongoing violence in some areas and mistrust of the people were the two main challenges facing the World Health Organization. 
According to the United Nations Population Fund, Cyclone Idai affected more than 75,000 pregnant women with about 45,000 births expected over the next six months. Of those births, 7,000 are at risk of life-threatening complications due to flooding and destructions. Hundreds of people were killed by the storm and subsequent flooding in Mozambique, Zimbabwe and Malawi. In the hard-hit town of Namatanda, some 100 kilometers northwest of Beira, the family of Shano Bengala is waiting for their newborn baby to arrive home. But the house where the mother and the baby will be returning to misses a wall and the sun is shining through the bamboo sticks and metal sheets on its damaged roof. Bengala's son, Samuel Shao, now seven days old, was born a week after the cyclone Idai smashed into Mozambique on March 14th, causing catastrophic flooding and damage or destroyed 33,600 houses across the area. The baby has problems with taking food and has to stay under doctor's watch in a damaged hospital ward. Many families face the challenge as hundreds of thousands of people are in need of food, water and shelter in Mozambique. For those with newborns and expecting the babies shortly, the demand for safety and access to health care is even higher. I was very worried because we live very far away in Gorongonza. So when the cyclone arrived, I was worried about my daughter. She already has a big belly, but now unfortunately, I'm happy as the baby is born. Cyclone Idai affected more than 75,000 pregnant women, with 45,000 births expected over the next six months, according to the United Nations Population Fund. Of those births, 7,000 are at risk of life-threatening complications due to flooding and destruction. Women in Sofala province, where some areas are still flooded and roads and bridges destroyed, may need surgeons to help deliver their babies safely. Some of them may not be able to reach hospitals, many of which, like the Namatanda Hospital, are seriously damaged, lack supplies and are short-staffed. The situation is better, but there are still women delivering on the roads on the way here, despite better access that we have now. The second largest medical facility in Sofala province is serving the population of 34,000 people and some of the villages still have no way to reach for medical help in case of emergency. We still don't have aid in full totality. I still feel the need for more resources to be able to transfer patients here. With 1.85 million people affected by the cyclone in Mozambique, the government, with help from abroad, struggles to restore basic maternal and child health care. The region may also have lost infrastructure worth more than 1 billion in the disaster, including damage to the Mozambican port of Beira, the coastal city where the cyclone came ashore, according to the UN Economic Commission for Africa. But for Bengala's family, all they want is to have their son with them. For years, the residents of Giheta and Ruseke lived peacefully, sharing the same water source between the two villages. The horrors of the 1994 genocide changed all that, as Rwanda spiraled into horrific violence. 25 years on, the water source is bringing the once divided villages back together. For years, this water point brought together the villages of Ruseke and Giheta, a shared source of life, until the 1994 genocide. In 100 days, 800,000 people were killed in Rwanda, most of them from the Tutsi minority. Defroza lost her husband and son. It was a big surprise for us because these were people we used to socialize and drink with, people that were helping each other, inviting each other to weddings without any issue. It was so surprising. After the genocide, people from the two villages took turns to fetch water, to avoid crossing paths. It wasn't until 2005 that the first rapprochement between the two communities began. Jean-Claude was one of the first to attempt reconciliation by convincing his fellow Geheta residents to help the people of Ruseke with their farming. Asking for forgiveness was not easy at all. 
The first time we crossed to ask for forgiveness, there were around a hundred of us. People among us were scared. Years later, Jean and Rafosa live in peace, but for some, painful memories persist. Josepha is the only survivor of her family. Nobody has come to ask her for forgiveness. Today, she accepts the process of reconciliation, but only out of fear of being sidelined. For someone to admit to the crimes he committed only to the authorities, without returning to ask for forgiveness from his victims, do you think that is enough? It's far from enough. 25 years after the genocide, the pain lingers, but the younger generations hope to move forward. Children from the two villages were the first to gather together at the water point. Inhabitants of Geheta continue to help farm the lands of their Ruseke neighbours. And the spring has once more become a source of shared life. Kenya boasts some of the world's deadliest snakes. Among them are the green and black mambas and spitting cobras. As in other poor rural areas of Africa, Latin America and Asia, venomous snakes pose a public health risk that experts such as Royjan Taylor, director of the Bioken Venomous Snake Center, says has been neglected for far too long. Snake bites pose a serious health risk, especially among those living in arid and bushy areas. Kenya boasts some of the world's deadliest snakes, key among them puff adders, Gabon vipers, red and black spitting cobras, black mamba, green mamba, and boomslang, among others. According to Snake Bite Rescue Rehabilitation and Research Center, 300 to 500 people are admitted every month due to snake bites across the country, but many end up dying or losing their limbs because they cannot access antidotes. Quite frankly, whether you're driving a Mercedes-Benz or you're pushing a car in the back end of nowhere, if you're bitten by a snake, you should be taken care of. Considering that in this day and age, you have a father who's had to sell everything he has to be able to pay for a hospital bill of his daughter to get her out of hospital is ridiculous. You can't have a situation in today's life where people are suffering like that just because they stood on a snake. Anti-venom production method has changed very little since it was developed by French immunologist Albert Calmet in the late 19th century. It remains painstaking, time-consuming process, although researchers are working to develop synthetic alternatives. To produce the antivenom, a technician has to first milk a snake's venom in a dangerous manoeuvre that sees them hold the animal's head still while it binds a cup covered in a plastic film, releasing its poison. A small amount each time into the container. Small venom doses are then injected into a large domestic animal, usually a horse, to trigger an immune response and the production of toxin attacking antibodies. After several doses of a period of about a year, the horse produces so many antibodies that it becomes immune to the venom, at which point blood can be taken from the animal. An antivenom, however, usually works only for specific species or small group of species of snake. A key challenge, especially in poor remote areas of the world where most snake bites occur, is that most antivenoms need to be refrigerated. See, Fava Afrique um, pro stop producing antivenom because there is no money. And the problem is, as the world doesn't look at this problem, it is the poor person at the end of the line in the community that cannot afford it that's the person that's bitten. But unfortunately, they're not the customer. They're actually the end user. And therefore, governments, and the international community really should pick that up because it's the right thing to do. The WHO has launched a massive review of the availability, efficacy and safety of snake bite serum available in Africa where the majority of countries have no effective or affordable antivenom at all. Coming up after the break. We are in Dubai for the city's fair as African art is put under the spotlight. We're about to pay some bills. Don't touch that dial. Keep it switch.
Welcome back to Africa Focus. In case you just joined us, our side language interpreter today is Monica Mwangi. Now, rising artists from countries such as Lebanon, Morocco, and the United Arab Emirates harness millions of views on YouTube while singing in their own dialects. A case in point is Egypt's music scene, which remains vibrant with the electro Shahabi music, an exuberant popular blend seen by purists as too raucous. Another popular genre is alternative or underground, which has emerged in recent years. Standing before a rapt crowd, Ahmed Adel Ouz charm with his passionate performance of an Egyptian classic, evoking a romantic nostalgia for Arabic songs of the past. After a melodious introduction of the oud, the famed oriental lute, Adel crones his way through a mawal, a traditional melody boasting of long vowels. <laughs> The word heritage has a lot of different meanings and aspects. The songs that date back to 50 years are considered a kind of heritage. Yaleil, all night, he sings, with the dreamy languor of the original performer, Egyptian legend Mohammed Abdel Wahab. With cheers of Allah, the mesmerized audience show its appreciation. During events such as the Kaltumiant, the music of Um Kulthum, or Wahibat, the music of Adbel Wahab, organized by the 100-year-old institute. Adel is often the lead singer with an entire troupe from the Cairo Opera House, accompanying his powerful vocals. We keep saving our heritage in order not to lose our identity. That's why heritage bands are keen to perform heritage songs. We perform songs in spirit of this place. Egypt, a cultural powerhouse in the Arab world, has long enjoyed a booming music industry. In the past, the rise of singers such as Um Kalthum, Abdel Wahab, and other Egyptians, Abdel Halim Haif, among others, saw Cairo built as Hollywood of Arab songs, attracting talent from across the region. They are our destiny and heritage, and we admire them until now. They may not be of this era, but their songs still remain until now. Built in the 1990s, Gulf countries vying for cultural dominance emerged as rivals to Egypt's music industry. And Rotana, the Arabs' world largest record label, was formed in 1987. <laughs> We made good usage of all the company's heritage production and converted it into digital. We added background music to all our heritage songs and posted them on YouTube. The company is currently owned by businessman and Saudi prince Al Walid bin Talal. If we don't develop, we will not survive. And this is a major problem for everyone. If you don't keep up with new technologies, you will disappear. Uh, what we don't like too much in the heritage songs is the background music. So we try to perform the songs with our own background music. We mix the songs with a rock or jazz sound. The 2011 uprising in Egypt that plunged the country into political and economic chaos also saw a downtown in the domestic music industry. Yet the Egyptian metropolis remained alive with the sound of music. Dubai recently played host to the 13th edition of Art Dubai, an annual event that attracts dealers, artists and collectors from all over the world. For the first time in the festival's history, five galleries from Africa were also featured. Some of the continent's most prominent contemporary artists from Mauritania, Angola and Nigeria showcased their works. African and diaspora artists showcase their work at this year's Dubai Art Fair, a three-day annual event that attracted dealers, artists and collectors from all over the world. Works by artists from more than 40 countries and 90 galleries around the world were on display at the fair, which is considered one of the biggest contemporary art events in the region. This year's event also featured five galleries from sub-Saharan Africa, an increase from previous years, an indication of the growing influence of African art. That's a good move to be able to present uh, African artists because it's, it's, uh, they are very uh, coming forward in this world right now. Uh, it has been going on for now a few years. So I thought maybe this is an international fair. 
there is no African artist, so it's a good opportunity to, show, to present the strengths of African artists. Featuring artworks included some of the continent's most prominent contemporary artists, such as Mauritanians Omar Bal, Angola's Kiluwanji Henda, and Nigerians Uche Okeke, among others. The exhibition showed the growing appetite for more African art. The featured works reflect the large diversity of African art with a variety of media from traditional painting, photography, video and sound art. The point is how do they, African artists, see things and not how others on the outside view what they are doing. It's Africa's point of view which is at the forefront here because they live there and they know better than anyone else how to talk about what is going on. The fair also displayed Bawaba or Getaway in Arabic, a special section featuring 10 solo presentations showcasing works by artists either based in or focused on projects about Africa, Latin America, the Middle East, Central and South Asia. French Cameroonian Bawaba curator Elisa Tanga said an African section of the fair not only gave a chance to widen Africans' connection to the international scene, but also enabled African artists interpret their artistic expressions in their own voices. Up until now, I have concentrated on art fairs or contemporary fairs that are solely about Africa. So it seems timely to us to open ourselves to the world. So the idea is to widen our horizons, and we consider Dubai to be the right place. Kenya's Wanja Kimani was one of the 17 African artists who featured at the fair. Kimani, whose works explores themes of cultural adherence, identity, and migration, says cross-cultural exchanges like the art fair can go a long way in strengthening African artist visibility. I think there's a mutual interest between the Gulf and Africa. And I think it's been a historical interest um, that is now growing so that Africa can be more of a, um, can be more advantageous at this time rather than historically. So when it comes to culture, it's only natural that that will follow the economic interest in Africa. At Dubai is part of the cultural event Art Week. Triggerfish is a South African studio that is redefining animation movies on the African continent. Based in the coastal city town of Cape Town, it is currently the largest animation studio on the continent, producing African-themed stories with the aim of penetrating the global entertainment industry. The Adventures of Zambezia is an animation film lauded by critics for being among the best South African animation films ever created. Maybe it's time I did. Die! The film, which was released in 2012, was made and produced by Triggerfish Animation Studios and went on to make over 34 million US dollars at the box office, cementing the company as a trailblazer in African animation movies. I think animation is the, it's, it's the kind of grandest type of storytelling so you can do anything it's uh, whatever you can imagine you can create and you can use metaphor and talking animals and so it's just a, a it's a, a great way to communicate because you can bring across stories that can't be told in any other way the company's founders say that they wanted to create a diverse narrative for african children where they can see themselves represented on the screen and have an alternative to foreign animations a lot of for the content we do get uh, that does get produced in this medium is very Eurocentric um, and quite Western and I think there's definitely uh, a, a big value in, in, in diversifying that content in, in this industry and also sort of uh, there's a lot of uh, Afrocentric stories that can be told and that have that can really uh, sort of give productions a very high value. With a slew of accolades, including a 2018 Academy Award nomination for Best Short Film and numerous South African Film Awards, Triggerfish is now at the forefront of the industry. So Triggerfish have been going for quite a while. They've, I'd say that they've managed to produce features where, other where others uh, have been unsuccessful. So they're creating and producing their own content, which is fantastic, uh, within the feature space, which is huge. Um, they they're also they've just opening up a triggerfish academy which is fantastic because they really are all about growing uh and developing skills um and yeah so they 
they now are going to be doing that, uh, which is really cool. It is in the process of establishing the Triggerfish Academy, an initiative between the Walt Disney Company, which will teach industry-based skills to young people who may not have the means to follow a career path in animation. Triggerfish also recently moved into the gaming industry, establishing itself as a player in another budding South African market. On Africa Focus, we love hearing from you, so make sure you get interactive with us on our various social media pages. Remember, you can also view this program along with our wide array of other programs on DSTV Channel 268 and on ASM Channel 138. On behalf of the entire team here on Africa Focus, thank you for keeping us company on this exciting journey. Enjoy the rest of your viewing.